Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. It's five o'clock here in Arizona um, and eight o'clock on the East Coast. I'm Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we have, uh, we're delighted to have two authors with us this evening. Sarah James is going to be talking about her. I love the title of both of your books, by the way, The Woman with Two Shadows. And um, Julia Bryan Thomas uh, has a book out here called, for, I'm sorry, For Those Who Are Lost. I love that title as well. And um, we have some signed book plates for, for Julia's book and a recipe card. And I think we also have, we're gonna establish this, but I think we have some book plates for Sarah too. But um, as always, you'll be delighted to know that I'm gonna be in the background. And so um, if you have questions for Sarah, Julia, or Barbara, just go ahead and put them in the chat field and um, I'll be happy to ask any of them when I am summoned back on screen. So Barbara, <laughs> over to you. Oh, thank you, Patrick. It makes me feel like a stage director that I, <laughs> I sort of feel Shakespearean when Patrick does this. But anyway, thank you for your introduction, Patrick, and welcome. Um, this is our first time to talk to Julia, who is a debut author, and to Sarah, who is not a debut author, but yes, no less. Yeah, yeah. Are you a debut author? My first. I didn't read. With all the people following you, you must have some sort of connection to well, the I mean, book world. what? <laughs> In person? Ah, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, my goof. Sorry about that. No, I mean, Charles Finch, I noticed that he was a follower of yours on Instagram and so forth. So I thought you probably were a seasoned author. Oh, uh, no. First, okay. first well, time. even more exciting than we have two debuts. Now, these are both stories that are set in World War II, and they are part of or contribute to what seems to be an absolute raging storm of women's stories set in World War II, as opposed to the military novels and, you know, the sorts of things that focused on the fighting. Um, and I want to point out, um, and this, this is definitely true of source books and maybe true of a lot of other publishers, that there's a sort of cover code, at least for source books, in printing these books. If you look, you can see that in general, what they do is they, they show you the back of women in appropriate period attire. And it's like a signal for, you know, the kind of story it is. And this reminds me so much of when there was a fashion for, um, I'm trying to remember what the books were. They were also women's stories, but they were very sexy and jazzy. And the covers all showed women with sexy rears and stockings with, um, do you remember those? They always had stockings with the seams showing and then really <laughs> bitch pumps. And, you know, it was, it was some chiclet. That was it. So there was an entire wave of chiclet. Oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. And this is kind of an interesting version of it. it. You know, when we're talking about much more modest clothes and, you know, women sort of like walking into their stories or walking into their future. Um, so I just, I just think it's interesting how, how publishers decide to package their books because authors don't really get to do that. It's something you might not be aware of. Some authors get input into covers, but generally it's the publisher that designs the covers and oftentimes the titles. So Patrick said he loved these titles. Julia, did you pick your own title and then Sarah? I sure did. I definitely did. I just pitched it and loved it and they said, oh, we don't need to change it. So I was really happy about that. That's wonderful. How about you, sir? I did not. I did not. I was, I was told, I was actually kind of, we were given a list um, um, of like some titles that they suggested and that's the one we settled on. I actually asked them, um, they wanted it to be the, the girl with two shadows. And I asked them, could we please make it woman? That's a pet peeve of mine when fully grown adult women are called girls. So I, I pitched that, but um I was I was told this is your title now, basically. Well, I love also, it, so it worked out. <laughs> well, it does, but this is also a characteristic of this wave of stories about women is that generally the word girl, woman, mother, sister, um, or other female, you know, is is in the title, and um, I, I find that interesting too. Publishing tends to follow trends, and you know, somebody comes along and sets one and is successful, and then there's a, a kind of a, a, a rush, you know, to follow it, and then we're always waiting for the next big thing that is going to change it, 
and forecast the new trend. That's the most common question I get um, as a bookseller is what's the next big thing? So I predicted it would be the new Gothic two years ago. And in fact, the new Gothic is the next big thing. So, wow. uh, and your husband, Will, Julia, actually <laughs> wrote a fabulous Gothic in his series where they're off on the island. Um, oh, yes. It's like Hell three, Bay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was Hell Bay. So Will was the head of the trend. <laughs> I love it. So <laughs> tell me, why, tell is it, why is it you think that women's stories of the war which is, after all, um, 80 years old now, um, 80 years in the past. Why do you think it has become such a, a popular genre for people to read? I think that's an interesting question. I had uh, read some women-type World War II novels, and I had never planned to write one. It hadn't even crossed my mind. But I had been doing a lot of reading about World War II because it's just a fascination of mine. And I came across some information about Guernsey and I realized it was something I'd never heard in a book or seen in a movie. It was about the evacuation of 5,000 children in a 24 hour period off the island. And I'm a teacher myself. I've taught first grade for 25 years. So I just tried to imagine how would I feel as a teacher? The teachers were evacuating with children on cattle barges and fishing boats and everything that they, they could get over. And the people of Guernsey had 24 hours notice. So that's that was my hook into it. Once I realized that, I, that idea just wouldn't let me go. So it was just a more personal choice rather than, you know, thinking about a genre. Yeah, uh, like, like Julia, I did not really set out to write a World War II <laughs> novel. Um, I, I've just kind of always been really interested in the Manhattan Project. So that was like really the only interest that I had in World War II was um, in that world. Um, but I think just um, to go back to the question, I think there's like just something interesting in, in going back to a, a period of time or like an event that we feel like we know and coming at it and exploring like a different um, a different perspective on it because the perspective of World War II that's been told for the last 80 years is, uh, you know, uh, the combat and the, the male perspective. And I think it's, it's very interesting to, to go back and um, look at things from a different, different point of view. So many stories about World War II are really, you know, the grand stage. I mean, they're political or military history. We can talk about Churchill's memoirs or whatever. And I find that the women's stories are, you know, they're, they're small stories. They all contribute to it, but they tend to be small and personal. Um, and yet they remind us that even though this giant stuff was going on, that ordinary lives were still being led by people. They still had to, um, you know, do the normal stuff. Um, I mean, big questions have come up, was came up yesterday when I was talking to, trying to remember who I was talking to yesterday, sorry. <laughs> Every day I'm talking to somebody at least once. Uh, we were talking about the difficulties of policing during wartime and policing in London. Um, what do you do, you know, when criminals are um, almost enabled to pursue um, their, their nefarious activities because the police force, a lot of the good ones have already gone off to fight. Who's left, you know, to to actually look after the city in so many ways. And many of these stories have been set in book environments like the last bookshop or whatever. So I find that to be fun, too. Anyway, um, so landscapes. Let's talk more about Guernsey, Julia, because it is indeed a wonderful island. I think we knew more about Jersey, don't you think? Because there was a big masterpiece theater thing about the Jersey Lily, Lily Langtry and her oh, yes. you know, relationship with Edward VII, who was certainly a man who enjoyed many female relationships, but she was an extraordinary woman. Um, and so Jersey, I think, is, is in many ways better known, but if I'm not mistaken, isn't Guernsey a larger island than, than Jersey? It is. It is a larger island. And at the time, uh, during World War II, there were 40,000 people who lived there. While you were uh, talking about 
um, small stories of women, it, it made me think the small stories are the, the common stories. And those are the ones we relate to. Those are the ones, you know, it was, it's the bird's eye view of the, of the people on the ground and we can really empathize with them. But Guernsey, um, you're right, is is a little bit lesser known, but it's a beautiful island from everything that I've heard. I've been in Western France and I've been in Southern England, but I haven't made it all the way over there. I'm gonna to have to do that one of these days. Well, it's a, it is lovely. Um, when, when I was there in 2019, uh, one of the things we did was we hiked much of the way around uh -huh. the island, which set us mm -hmm. up to have lunch in the, in the main city. I can't remember what it's called at the moment, but there, um, you know, you might imagine that seafood would be, sorry? St. Peterport. Thank you, St. Peterport. Right? Yeah. Um, and I remember sitting in the restaurant, you know, where they were pulling together this marvelous feast and looking out um, and thinking about what it would have been like to anticipate the Germans sailing in mm -hmm. to occupy the island, because in fact, they did occupy the Channel Islands, which are British, mm -hmm. but closer to France. Um, so it was really tough on um, on the islanders to decide what to do. Did you watch the movie, the Guernsey, uh, what is it, Potato Peel Society? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Literary and uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I've seen the movie and read the book too. I was going to say before they occupied uh, Guernsey, the Germans came in and bombed the bombed St. Peter Port. Um, right in the harbor and the reason they did is because there were crates all over the harbor and they thought there were munitions in there from England and it was actually tomatoes that they were trying to export for money and that they used to trade for medicines and things like that so you know that that's how it all started there. Wow. So was Guernsey primarily um, um, an agriculture and fishing um, economy? It is, and uh, in the summer, in the pretty months, they come over from France and you know from across Europe, and so they're bustling a little bit in the summertime. People love to come and paint um, all over, all across the island because it's so pretty. So the Germans didn't occupy it for military reasons. It was just like a stepping stone <laughs> towards England, but they weren't acquiring munitions factories or anything. That's right. Country. Right. No. So, Sarah, what is it about Oak Ridge that, I mean, I moved to Oak Ridge um, with a husband who went to work at Y-12 in, you wow. know, um, a chemical engineer in 1965. And wow. um, they still had, at the entrance to the town, they still had, you know, the um, um, patrol gates and, you know, the gunnery, you know, with gun yeah. spots and all the rest of it. And the town had grown quite a lot yeah. from where where it was. It's set with in, in the hills. It was it's kind of isolated, although it's quite near Knoxville. So i you know, in a way I'm interested that um, it wasn't it wasn't a very developed area. And the plants were still the big plants Y12 and I can't remember what's the other one. Uh, it's X or something. X10. <laughs> yeah, X10. Yeah. Yep. X10. We're still going um, going strong and there was yeah. still um, a whole thing about, you know, um, not, you had to have, um, you had to be vetted. There was a whole big security thing that went on if you worked there. I remember the FBI coming to the house and, you know, quizzing me about um, our family and my husband and, you know, they did these kind of checks. So it was 20 years on, but it still felt, um, and people's memories were very um, active about what it was like in the war. So what drew you to it? I mean, I was just very interested in the idea that like you had like Los Alamos where like a lot, you know, like kind of the big, like, you know, Oppenheimer and all the big names that we kind of associate with the Manhattan Project were. And then you have this town that like not as many people know about being connected to uh, the Manhattan Project where like kind of just the business of it, like the, like the work, the like the factories and the actual like, um, kind of I don't, I don't want to use the word grunt work but that's that kind of like um the necessary business rather than like the big science um so I was just really interested in in that element of the of the project because I felt like it it wasn't something that um that I'd ever heard about before 
you know, because the towns were put together in secrecy and so suddenly to develop the Manhattan Project, they had like two or three housing plans. That was it. And they had these prefab houses that they would come in. And what was really weird for me is that many years after I left Oak Ridge, I went to Los Alamos and there were this, it was exactly the same, the houses and all, but people, you know, people had begun to modify them. Yeah. But nonetheless, it was so creepy, you know, to, to have lived in, in the middle of that. Our first house there was one of the old um, ones from the 40s that had hardly been updated. And then to find it up on top of the mesas in yeah. a completely different yeah. landscape, wildly different landscape. Yeah, so and, and Oak Ridge grew like so, like way more than they really anticipated. So yeah. a lot of the housing was like really slapped together there because they had just so many more people come that they needed to work than they had ever, ever thought about. And today, because of the roads, you know, being expanded, the highway system, Highway 40 doesn't, Interstate 40 is not too far away. It's almost mm -hmm. like suburban Knoxville. Um, but mm -hmm. it wasn't then. It was much more isolated in, in the 40s. And it's, it's really surprising how it was kept secret. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've talked about that. And Julia, you, you, you would know that about England, like the, um, you know, the code breaking project. People really took it seriously when they signed, um, you know, the um, state secrets policy. And before social media and all, it was actually possible to build a whole town like a bridge and, and nobody and, and send people to live there. And yet nobody really knew about it. It's so funny because I, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Julia. I, <laughs> I work for the, the city government here in Los Angeles. And I was just um, like a couple of days ago at a bar, like loudly talking about all the things that the government was doing, you know, that happened that day at work. And I was like, man, I would not have, <laughs> not have cut it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it <laughs> i just lost it's really true you know i don't think that is possible to keep those kinds of secrets today yeah. with social media um you know everybody has a phone and and finds it irresistible we actually had a scandal here at the mayo clinic when one of the surgeons operating on a very personal part of a man's anatomy was so entranced with his tattoo, he took out his phone and took a photo and posted oh it goodness. and, you know, ended his career. But it was, I mean, it was a real intrusion into patient privacy. But I thought, my first question was, why did he even have a phone in the mm -hmm. operating theater? And why didn't anybody catch it? I mean, do we frisk people now? You know, so, I mean, it's just such a difference, isn't it? It seems so unsanitary. I mean, they have to scrub and everything. What are you doing touching a dirty phone? Well, okay. yeah, but I mean, even more more interesting is the fact that it, it seems so much a part of him. You know, it's almost like a third arm or something that, that nobody <laughs> even checked. And then if you go back when they were constructing, you know, Oak Ridge, today everybody be... <laughs> you know, the pictures. Yeah, totally. <laughs> So different. All right, so let's go back to the, let's go on to talk about the choices. Your characters have to make very interesting, very painful choices that really alter the course of their lives and the course of other people's lives. So Julia, as a teacher, you think that must have had extra resonance for you that you're talking about a teacher who had to make a decision about what, what would happen to her two charges as forced on her really by her sister. I, I do. I I really identified with these characters, both of the characters, actually, one who's in charge of two children that she's taking on, on a strange cattle barge to get across to England where she has never been before, but also um, the character Ava, who is the children's mother. So my book kind of focuses on two different women, the, women, the one who escaped Guernsey before for the occupation with these two children and what happens as they get separated and the woman who's left behind and talking about what it's really like to live on an occupied island, what it's like to lose all your freedoms, what it's like to go five years without knowing where your children are. So the Red Cross was supposed to contact them as frequently as, frequently as they could. And sometimes they did once or twice during the war, but they just didn't have the means they couldn't keep up with that many children, so many 
people evacuated uh, during that time and some people just got lost. And so that's where my title comes from. At the near the end of the book, they're discussing the, the pastor of the churches, and all the churches had been, you know, vandalized and ransacked and just practically destroyed. And as they tried to rebuild their lives, and pastors would come together and say, let's have a service for those who were lost. And, you know, they it may have been through death or separation or prison camps, but but um, you know, it was just such a, just a powerful idea to me to imagine not seeing my own children for, for five years or what it would be like uh, to be put in that position to be responsible for someone else's children. So you have a boy that's nine and a little girl mm -hmm. that's four, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And indeed the mother and father have to decide in a 24 hour period whether to send their children off to England and they're okay with it because, well, they're not okay with it. They agree to do it because their teacher um, is the one who's gonna be responsible for them. But then the teacher's sister, who is trapped in a terrible marriage, decides mm -hmm. that um, her one chance to get out of it, because you know, divorce, divorce wasn't common in those times either. It was really difficult. She decides that if she can persuade her sister to let, to let her take, the abused wife to take the place of her sister, the teacher, that she can get off the island and be responsible for these two children. But she doesn't really think that much about what it's going to be like to be responsible for two young children mm -hmm. until she lands in England. And then all of a sudden, there she is. There so, she is. Yeah. And then the mom left behind not only loses her children, but her husband is off. And so there's a whole exploration mm -hmm. of what it would be like to have a sympathetic German. Um, so you covered a lot of ground in this book. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I did. I, I wrote it actually pretty quickly too. I just got so excited. Uh, I worked on it over the pandemic summer because as a teacher, I was sent home from school in March and we didn't know when we were going back. We didn't know, you know, what COVID was going to mean for all of us. We didn't, we were trying not to get sick. You know, we were washing our groceries and everything. So I decided um, I had been playing around with just some, some casual ideas. And I thought, what if I pursued this and I sat down to work on it and I just got into just the history of it. I just, I love history anyway. I had been reading Eric Larson. book the splendid and the vile it's like that it, it makes you go pick up four other books so you can find out a little bit of another piece of the puzzle so um it was i really enjoyed working on this and and exploring what all these characters went through it was fun writing from a nine-year-old boy's perspective as well which is something i've never done before but as a teacher of course um i've known a lot of little young uh boys in my time and that became one of my favorite He's a, he's a very brave boy and um it's true that the war forced children to grow up really fast we kind of forget now how fast people had to grow up i mean back in the middle ages girls were considered marriageable at 12 mm -hmm. you know as soon as they started menstruating it was um you know time for them to uh, to get married and be in charge of families so basically they had teenagers you know raising babies um and but people didn't live that long, so they had to kind of get on with it. Sarah, um, twins, twins are always interesting. So, yeah. yep. So, what, how did your novel come to you? How did you conceive your story? Um, I had actually started as a screenplay. My uh, master's degree is in screenwriting, and this was the first uh, screenplay that I wrote in that program. And they did not start as twins, but um, somebody in my, literally like my first semester, first screenwriting class. And I pitched this idea of a woman who goes to Oak Ridge to investigate the disappearance of her sister. And somebody in the class um, was a twin uh, <laughs> and now a now very successful writer with his twin brother. They uh, write a number of projects together. And um, he said, what if it was her twin sister? And she has to like pretend to be her twin sister as she's investigating um, her sister's disappearance. And I just thought that was such a, there's something that's like 
kind of Shakespearean about it. <laughs> and um, I really love, I'm a, I'm a theater person uh, at heart. And I just loved the, the potential of, of having her have to literally pretend to be uh, her own sister. Um, thought that was, it. and it allowed me to um, kind of uh, get into some of the things that I'm really interested in, in terms of like, how do we see ourselves and how do we like present ourselves to the world? And, and um, what does that reaction look like? So it, it was a, it was a fun idea. It's interesting that both of you, you know, have a substitution thing here going on, you know, mm -hmm. one identity being <laughs> assumed by another. But, you know, I mean, if you're soaked in crime writing, such as I am, the first thing that occurs to me when that happens is the danger if the sister has disappeared and yet you present yourself as that sister who has disappeared, you have really made yourself a target for yeah. whoever made that person disappear. <laughs> yep. Um, so, you know, the danger quotient is, is really quite high. Did you think about that? But what better way to, to figure out who's responsible? <laughs> well, no, that's totally true. But, you know, you do, it does mean that you have to have, you know, today you might have a security detail, but what did she do <laughs> to protect herself while, um, while, when she assumed this role or did she even think about it? I mean, I do think, um, I, I honestly thought, like reading Julia's book, we have kind of similar protagonists in that I think they they kind of get swept into like a, a moment and make a decision without really thinking through like all the ramifications of that decision. Um, so I do think like the moment where she doesn't like go in deciding to be her sister, what happens is she's, um, she's arrived in Knoxville. She can't figure out how she, the person she was supposed to meet who was going to take her to Oak Ridge didn't show up. She's not sure what to do. And then she runs into some people who mistake her for her sister. And they're like, oh, it's, it's you come with us. We're going back to Oak Ridge. And so she's like, well, this is like my only shot. So I guess I'll do it. Um, and without kind of, um, thinking through all of the, the danger that she's really putting herself in. Although at that point in the story, she's not, um, she's not really convinced that there is any danger. <laughs> well, no, that's certainly yeah. true. And the additional thing is that you can't just go to Oak Ridge. You know, right. I mean, there's right. A, I mean you, have, you, you have to have some sort of badge permission, passport, mm -hmm. whatever it might be, but you can't just stroll in as though you were you know, going to shop there or be a common tourist. So you're right that probably her only channel, you know, to get into Oak Ridge would be to assume her sister's identity. But did she have any validation of that? Did it require, you know, any sort of badge or paperwork? I have her, um, I mean, I don't want to like. <laughs> no, I know. We can't go any further <laughs> than this, right? Um, well, one thing that I did think is funny is there's a scene in the book where they, uh, they sneak out through like a hole in the fence at Oak Ridge. And my editor was like, I don't, I don't know if I believe that. That doesn't sound like it, it, it would happen. And I was like, that's literally something that I pulled from, <laughs> from somebody's uh, autobiography who worked at Oak Ridge, that there was a <laughs> hole in the fence. So, you know, um, anytime the government's involved in uh, security, there's always going to be ways to get around it because <laughs> government work. Wow. <laughs> walls throughout their history, walls have always been breached, you know, I don't care if it's the Great no. Wall of China or Trump's wall <laughs> or whatever, or the Berlin Wall, you know, if you have a yeah. wall, then you always have somebody who's, you know, wants to breach it. So um, I, mm -hmm. I'm sure there was a hole in the fence, probably. I mean, I know the terrain intimately, and it would be almost impossible to actually maintain a fence perimeter with any kind of mm -hmm. um, great security for, for a long time long period so yeah yeah I, and it was a pretty big site too so yeah yeah so um what's the background of this we, so we can't go forward what's the background of the twins you know that that causes one to go to Oak Ridge and to work and one to stay behind um well one is uh uh I mean they're they're very different you know one is like um she's 
she's more traditionally feminine. That's, that's the sister who goes on ahead. And she basically just goes there because her, um, her boyfriend, who is a, a physics uh, student, uh, undergrad student at Columbia, gets hired there. So she just goes with him. Um, and then her sister is a, um, a little bit, uh, less traditionally feminine. She, she wants to have a career. She's also, um, a physics student, uh, at Columbia and, um, but she didn't want to go to Oak Ridge for work, like, um, her sister's boyfriend, because she thought it was a waste of her time. She's very like, um, <clears throat> little headstrong in that way. She, she was like, I, I'm, I'm going to be here and I'm going to work and then I'll, then I'll see you guys later. Have fun. Um, but she, she makes the decision to go down there and, um, kind of when she's down there investigating her sister's disappear disappearance, she figures out like, oh, they're actually doing something that's pretty big and pretty interesting down here. And maybe I shouldn't have, uh, written this, this project off. She's not a warm and fuzzy character. That's no. for sure. She's, no. quite, she's quite prickly and very headstrong. Yeah, um, she's an interesting character, and in opposition to her sister, um, it's, you know, twins don't have to be alike emotionally. They may be alike physically, but you know, they may be completely different. And I, th I thought you did a good job in pointing that out. That you know, they weren't clones. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was like um, I think that was important to me because I do. Um, I, I think like there's a tendency, I think, for historical fiction to um, kind of paint women in, in like a, a very like m muted tone, you know? So to, I wanted to have um, a, a real difficult <laughs> later. Well, Julia, Julia did the same thing. I mean- the Yeah, oh yeah, was... yeah. And I think that's why I, I, I I liked Julia's main character so much too, because she, she was also like a, a very uh, powerful person. So Julia, let's go back to her. She had to make some interesting choices, um, you know, and as a person who was bent on survival, um, she, you know, she made some very difficult choices. I think the nine-year-old boy is the one who paid the biggest price, just my opinion, um, the way you wrote the book. Right. He for did. her decision. He did. And, you know, I was just kind of exploring complicated characters. I, and Sarah, I have to say, I loved your characters in this story so much. And uh, another thing I wanted to mention to you is the tension in the book is just so good and so strong. But when you have complicated characters like that, I feel like, you know, you don't, you have to ask yourself, can somebody be a good person who does a terrible thing? So there's some sometimes some terrible things that are done. This question kind of comes up at the end of Sarah's book too, where there's a quote, and I, I can't say it exactly the way you wrote it, but it's um, you know something like, "How could this have happened? Um, you know how how could how could we have allowed been a part of this and allowed all of this to happen?" But I think that people make emotional choices, especially late at night on a terrible day and you decide at the spur of the moment you're leaving your husband and you take off and you my character Lily hadn't thought her situation through at all well I don't think the hard choice, her only thought had been to get away yeah I don't think her hard choice is the one to leave the island and you oh know, no no it's not her sister I think right. most of us can empathize with that you know if you're trapped in a horrible right. marriage and the sister the teacher's sister was somewhat reluctant to go anyway she won't really want mm -hmm. to stay home and look after her parents and all so i don't think that one was so difficult but when she arrives in england and has to decide what to do with the two children that right. i think was a you know the, the little boy is almost thrust into a dickensian situation i mean i you know i'm thinking yeah. oliver twist here because he's only nine mm -hmm. and he's there he is he's he suddenly yeah. cast adrift totally by himself so Lily does separate the children and she takes the four-year-old girl with her and she puts the boy on the train. She's thinking so many different kinds of things. He can't take care of a four-year-old. He can't even take care of himself. Uh, she can't send a four-year-old on a train full of little boys and teachers and, you know, not very many teachers either. There, it wasn't 
um, the as many teachers by far as children. So, you know, it's just all chaos. And they were sent off, often put on trains the very same night they arrived after a long journey across the English Channel. So um, she justifies it to herself that she can't leave a little girl, but she can't take both of them. So um, she has she struggles with that decision for the rest of her life. And so that's that was very interesting to me. She told me, you know, during the writing, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I, I want to do this, I want to help with the war efforts, but what, what we know about her from the, just the very beginning of the story was that she was capable of doing something no one should ever do, so it was uh, just very uh, interesting trying to write her and set the right tone for that story. I'm not sure that her arguments for convincing herself that she couldn't take care of both children really worked. Did you struggle with that? Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit, but I think that aren't terrible decisions sometimes, um, you know, snap decisions. So, um, I, I think that you're right. I think that was a flimsy excuse. I think that's what she was telling herself and she goes off and rebuilds her life in a whole new way based on not one lie, but actually several lies. So, um, so that's in it all comes down to how does it affect these children later and what is their trajectory in their lives going to be? How did it affect them? So um, it was very exciting to write for me to write the end of the book as I told what happened in the, you know, intervening years so we could find out what really happened to the kids and how they felt about what happened to them too. And that like that, I love the, the end of your book. I don't want to give it away too much, obviously, but um, I, I just, I feel like sometimes when you like have that kind of like long, like explanation, it can be so unsatisfying, but this was like, I, I, I loved it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think we both have main characters who are, are really good at like justifying what they want to do to you know, um, and I think that that's really interesting because I think that's something everybody does, you know, it's just our characters do it with decisions that are, you know, bigger than like mm -hmm. what most of us do in our everyday lives where we're like finding excuses to order pizza when we already wanted pizza, you know, um, your, your character is finding an excuse for kidnapping a child or um letting a child exactly. go on the train um which isn't obviously something that we do but I do think it's a very human impulse to kind of want something and then to work backwards from there and figure out mm -hmm. okay, how do I how do I want this and do it and still think of myself as a good person mm -hmm. I think I think you're right and I That's think true. that um because Lily really just wants a new life for herself. She wants to get out of this marriage. She's not there because she wants to take care of two children. Um, right. They're just a, you know, a vehicle for her uh, mm -hmm. in order to escape the life that she's got. And, um, and I, I, you know, it's an extremely selfish act in some ways, but it turns out that um, it affects some good. And you have to ask yourself, what would have happened if the children had stayed on the island? What would have happened if Helen, the sister who was far less capable and emotionally not really willing to leave, what if Helen had in fact been the one that took the children? Would it have been any different? I um, actually feel like one or both of them could have gone lost another way. So many children were lost during the war. And so many children who were evacuated never made it back home. So it's very interesting to me that there were a lot of different kinds of endings. I did some research into people who had evacuated and into people who stayed on Guernsey during the occupation. So I was actually listening to firsthand accounts of people talk about their experiences. And I didn't hear anything exactly like my book, but it was just so rich to um, listen to people tell their own real true story of their own struggles during this time. So just, it was, you know, it's just a free for all. Well, it happened in other contexts too. The kindertransport was when German families decided to 
put their children on trains to England, primarily Jewish families, but I don't, maybe not. I should know that. Anyway, there was a kinder transport and you know, it was German parents in the same deciding to evacuate their children. And then we had, you know, London parents sending their children out to what they thought would be safer places. And some of those children, their lives were totally different and mm -hmm. you know, didn't make it back. Um, one of the truly great TV dramas about World War II, um, and now I'm having, it's set in Hastings, why am I having this moment that um, Anthony um, Horowitz wrote? Oh yes, Foyle's War. Thank you, Foyle's War. Sorry, I'm having a senior moment, maybe it's the wine. Um, but Foyle's War, actually, one of the episodes deals with a child who's evacuated from London and is oh. completely adrift, you know, down in Hastings without, so there were children moved all over, you know, mm -hmm. the globe during the war, and um, many of the stories are truly tragic, and many mm -hmm. of them, certainly, there were a lot of children sent to Canada, too, you know, many of those children never made it back to their families. Um, Let's see, Patrick is telling Especially. me, Patrick sends me messages, Kinder Transport, the children's transport was the informal name of a series of rescue operations for children. So, mm -hmm. you know, the Guernsey one, I think it was the time crunch that made it mm -hmm. so difficult. I mean, to make a choice like that in under 24 hours, that was largely irrevocable because the Germans mm -hmm. arrived on the, what, that afternoon or the very next morning. Right. Uh, it was uh, actually a few days. There, there was a few days lapse in between. The parents who were left there had the opportunity. They were kind of told they would get to go after their children or their children would be returned to them. But they were busy thinking, what do we do? Do We can't sell our homes, but what are we going to do with our livestock? What are we going to do with yeah. our lives and our livelihoods? How do we get loose so we can go too? And, but before they could, the, the port was bombed, and then it, then after that, everyone was trapped. Absolutely. So in your case, Sarah, um, what was it that Lillian gave up? Or, you know, did she walk out of a life that she was able to reclaim later or thought she could reclaim? Um, uh, what do you mean? Well, I mean, when she decided to go to Oak Ridge and assume her sister's identity, she had to leave. What, yeah. what did she leave behind? Yeah. Did she think she could go back to it? I mean, I think in her mind, she when she does leave, she's thinking, "I'll just, I'm just going to be down there for a week, and it's, you know, um, it's not going to be a big deal." She thinks that um, it's it's the sister's boyfriend who contacts her to say that her sister's missing, mm -hmm. and she thinks. Um, it's, it's not that big a deal. She thinks he, she's just dumped him and like, is doesn't want to talk to him. And she's like going to go down there and sort this out and she'll be back within a week. And, um, it's only once she's down there that she realizes that the situation's far more complicated than she had originally believed it to be. So she didn't actually consider a life, it was going to be a life-changing kind of a thing. Like, like, um, Julia's character. Yeah, yeah. She she kind of just um I I think she's very I think she's very dismissive of ideas that she doesn't have herself. <laughs> so <laughs> so because it's not it's because she's not the one who found out her sister's missing, it's not that big a deal. Um she's it's just a hysterical man um, who got dumped and doesn't want to deal with it. So Sarah, what would you like to ask Julia about her book and vice versa? I've done all the questioning. What would you guys like to ask? I want to know, Julia, I mean, <laughs> your book covers so, like you cover the entire war, which was just like so impressive to me because my book is like, like a few months and that was really hard for me. <laughs> so like, how, how, how did you decide that's, that's the scope of the story that you wanted to tell? And how did, and how did you do all that, all that research? I think, and this, thank you. And I think the scope may, may have seemed bigger because um, I do, you know, uh, I go forward at the end of the book uh, by a number of years. So it really does span it. And I hadn't intended to do that. I hadn't 
as I was writing it, I thought, how am I going to end this story? How does this story even end? What, you know, and I was just building it incrementally as I went along. Um, I wanted to tell parts of the war that were important to individual characters in the book. What, what, what was it like? I wanted them to feel like you were stuck on an island and, you know, with, uh, with soldiers who respect there too. So it was just so interesting. And then uh, for Lily who got away, her life was different, but what was it like, you know, even Cornwall where she was, there were bombings there. There were um, blitzes in that part of the country too. So uh, I, I, I have to say the most excited I felt writing it was when I realized what the final chapter was going to be and who was going to tell that. And then getting to put all the pieces together that just, it, it's just like there was a puzzle with a bunch of missing pieces in it. and getting to put that all together was so much fun. Um, so anyway, I did try to, I read a lot about World War II, as I said, and I was trying not to cover a lot of ground other people had done. So um, I hope I was successful in doing that. Okay, I have to ask you a question now. Um, I loved your book. It was so interesting. And right off the bat, you have this math equation. And that, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I'm an English person. I'm not a math person. All the math, all the science. How did you prepare for something of that magnitude in, in a book? Oh, poorly is the, is the answer. <laughs> um, that equation, um, the process of getting that was like such a headache. And then what I had to do recently was figure out how to say it out loud to tell the person recording the audiobook. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what do I do? So I was like watching is is a lot of um just in researching the book, um, a lot of I have the, literally the idiot's guide to calculus. <laughs> that's, that's Good a, job. Desk. Um, a lot of like YouTube, like that's, that's mm -hmm. the, I don't understand how people wrote before the internet because I could not do it, but you know, like everything's on YouTube. So there's all these like lectures of like, you know, actual theoretical physicists, like doing very high level lectures. So a lot of it was just kind of listening to that, even though I didn't understand it, like listening to it long enough that I could like kind of parrot it back in like some way that hopefully was half believable. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that, that was uh, really a struggle for me. I have not taken a math class since high school. So <laughs> Same here. Here. came into play here I love that yeah, yeah. well that that's true that that was a really Julia um you're so right that a lot of Sarah's book you know the fascination of it is the science and I think I think it's a real gift when a person can explain science um mm -hmm. with or without understanding it much themselves to an audience and and make it interesting you know I never really loved early Tom Clancy. I know other people were devoted because I didn't really care about the military hardware and how it worked <laughs> out and all. But over the years, um, and now we're kind of an epicenter of books like that. Um, and the most recent Tom Clancy, Don Bentley wrote, which I'm happy to say after our event became, not because of our event, but after our event became a number two on this week's bestseller list. He has a real gift for, um, for making all of that interesting mm -hmm. you know and 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 understandable for somebody like me who really could care less what kind of weapon it is or or how to deploy it i think that's a real gift that fiction can give to people as opposed to you know some kind of a manual um so sarah you did you did that really well thank you it was you know i think it's like when you can do it in the service of the story that that helps you know i was literally just thinking about this i saw top gun maverick last night which i love but you know there's all these like you know airplane specifics that like yeah. i don't know or honestly care about but because they're presented in such a way that it's like part of the plot and like, like furthers mm -hmm. the you know the character's arc um 
it's, it becomes so much easier to understand the kind of technical details because they're part of a larger story. Right. That's a, that's and a good you don't want, you don't want the pacing of the story to suffer, right. As, you know, while, while you're doing it. So it is a real art to, um, manage to convey the technical aspects while keeping the story moving along. And that, that was definitely hard for me because there were parts where I was like, okay, I need to have like a page where I'm just like setting up science stuff. And like, you have to bear with me because it will <laughs> pay off, but it, um, it was difficult to, to kind of walk that line for sure. Well, you know, there's kind of a parallel about sex scenes. If you go too deeply into, <clears throat> pardon me, the mechanics of sex, you really slow your story down as opposed mm -hmm. to just ushering them to the door of, you know, the bedroom or whatever it is and closing it and leaving the reader to kind of work it out. I'm not, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of lengthy sex scenes because, you know, it's just boring. <laughs> I will say uh, if I had one note for Julia, I wanted, uh, I wanted a little more expansion on that, on the sex seat. There was like one line, Julia, was like, <laughs> and they made love. And I was like, tell me more. <laughs> uh -huh. um, the modern Regency novel is compared to the old one. I know, but, well, you know, we all, we all make choices and mechanics come into play in so many different fields that we have to design, which will work. So Patrick, why don't we call you back in our Shakespearean fashion here and see if you have any comments or questions well let's see here you came in with sex scenes so it was a great entry point. <laughs> um let's see here well not too many real questions um there's a question about about research that you've both kind of dealt with a little bit but can you give us a, both give us some insights into your into your deep dive into history any any tales of of that process I love maps. I have been a map reader since I was a little girl. I love atlases. And, and I just, as a child, I would just pour over maps and daydream what was happening in those places. So I, I still feel like I have to be really connected to the place that I'm writing by visualizing it the best that I can, by doing research. Like I said, I listened to um, both video interviews and, and I read Read book uh, books by people. One uh, was even a child, just to try to hear it in their own words. What that must have been like to go through, and I read everything about the time period. I love movies, especially you know all kinds of movies, but World War II movies. Oh, and I love Top Gun too. Wow, it's and so, it good. <laughs> so good. Good. I mean, sequel? Tom Cruise, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> It was so good. And you're right about how um, they made something technical understandable because it folded so neatly into the story. And that's what you did, too. I really liked that, Sarah. Great job. Uh, I, I think like researching historical fiction is so interesting because to me, at a certain point, it felt kind of like scrapbooking. Like you'd like read like one little tidbit and you'd be like, oh, that's, you know, I need to put that in there somewhere. It's like you kind of like collect all these little like moments and facts and and um like lines of like dialogue and stuff and and just kind of collage them all together but then also at a certain point you have to like let go of like the you know full historical accuracy you have to like realize your your number one um, job is to tell a compelling story so it, it, it's a very interesting because you obviously want to do a lot of research and you want to get it right but you kind of my like tactic was kind of to do a ton of research and then just kind of stop and and then go and I so I wasn't continually trying to like research and, and grind and keep up with it because at a certain point it, it's if there is a historical inaccuracy, and I know there are a few in my book, like where some dates that I fudged a little bit, um, but you know, it's in the service of telling a, telling a story that's compelling. So, so I can imagine. your screenwriting, um, you know, that's what you're really interested in, um, help you with that? Because I mean, the screenplay doesn't have room for 
a lot, sure. of, a lot of research and digression. So did you find that that helped you move along? Uh, for sure. I think um, the screenwriting, I, I definitely entered my screenwriting program. Like I love homework and I love like history and research and details. And that program also, cause it was like a very, um, I guess, industry focused program more than like a, you know, more art centered program, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, so it was a lot of, um, teaching me how to kind of prioritize, like you have to, you have to tell a story first. Like I, I remember one <laughs> advice in like, uh, in one screenwriting seminar we had, somebody in the class was like, oh, I feel like that's too much of like a movie scene. And the professor was like, but you're writing a movie. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, you know, I think sometimes like if you're, you know, you're, you have to remember you're writing something that, that is, entertainment at, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that your manuscript, maybe possibly both of you, would have little parent, parenthetical things saying, look this up, make sure I get the detail right, you know, <laughs> it's like that. Yeah. No, mine says don't. Don't look it up. <laughs> don't, go down, don't go down the rabbit hole. Just, uh, uh, or if you do, don't tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Did either of you see that movie? Um, it's World War One, but um, that Peter Jackson made called "They Would." Oh gosh, what was it called? Now they would not. Um, Barbara, do you remember it? The I don't. Really incredible. So I turned uh, to look it up while you're talking. Yeah, they would not. Okay. Oh shoot, they would not live long or something like that. Anyway, it was a documentary that he put together, and he painstakingly recreated all this amazing footage, World War I footage that was in the archives. And a lot of it was done, you know, when you see the footage, it's usually sped up and they're moving really fast and with hand crank cameras. Anyway, the reason I bring it up is that it's incredible documentary, but the only narration in the film is um, first person accounts by World War I veterans. So they tell the story because they, you know, in the seventies, I think, the BBC collected this vast archive of oral histories by World War I guys. And so you really get an amazing perspective on what it was like. It's so, called They Shall Not Grow Old. That's it. Oh, it, yeah. it is the documentary that runs for 11 hours and 39 minutes. So you, oh. I think it was sequential that you watched it. Mm -hmm. I saw it in the theater. It was only a couple hours. That's interesting. Did you? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't read. One hour and 39 minutes. I beg your pardon. Yeah. Blank. It must be the wine. <laughs> no worries. I mean, he did that Beatles documentary that was like eight hours long. That's so true. not outside the realm of possibility. Yeah, right. we, you know, we watched the end of it. We watched the, the first part of it. And as John Lennon got more and more stoned and the whole bit, we kind of <laughs> left the middle behind and we went cut to the rooftop. Um, that, that final thing really was, it really was interesting. And the constant brooding presence of Yoko Ono was right. so creepy. <laughs> it's amazing what they accomplished with their like late 20s, you know, and they were already calling it a day after this mm -hmm. incredible career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we digress. Uh, let's see. No other, real, <laughs> no other real questions from the audience, uh, except for, I mean, there are a couple about, you know, who are your favorite authors? Um, so we'll ask you that one should be better prepared to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to say what i've been reading okay now i i'm reading um i just finished the 1619 project with nicole hannah jones uh she came to town and uh, we got the opportunity to listen to her speak so that was interesting but i my favorite 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 um sort of i call it a modern classic is a gentleman from moscow so mm -hmm. Love Amor Tolls. I think he's just an incredible, you know, American gem. Of course, you're married to a really good author too. So I'm going to assume that the works of Will Thomas are popular with you, like they are with us. Oh, absolutely. That's right. I, I absolutely. And um, I've actually uh, typed or edited all of Will's books. So um, oh. I've, yeah, so it's been really, really fun I to be in on the process. And, yeah. yeah. Yep. They're very engaging. Sarah, you may not have read Will's books, but I, I can certainly recommend them. 
yeah, I will, I will do that. I've also written down a gentleman from Moscow. It's just that title. I'm like, oh, I'm intrigued. Oh. So good. <laughs> he's from Moscow. Uh, I really like, I, I mean, I feel like the author whose books I just devour any time there's a new one is Tana French. Like I just cannot get enough of oh, them. Yes. Dublin detectives. I, I love like when two mm-hmm. people solve crime together. That just is like my sweet spot. Into the Woods is my favorite of hers. Do you have a favorite? Oh, um. Oh gosh. I mean, it's really interesting because I, as I was, I read the likeness, like Mm -hmm. shortly after I turned in this book and I was like, oh, it's really interesting because it's kind of a similar premise. Mm -hmm. Like she has to pretend to, uh, to be somebody in order to solve a crime that, that happened to that person. And, um, so, so that's probably my, my favorite, just because it's a, a subject matter that I find, I find interesting or a device I find interesting. That's the one that she was promoting when she came here that one time, Barbara. I don't think you were in town for some reason. I wasn't, unfortunately. I have yet yeah. to meet her, even though I'm the one who, um, you know, we, Into the Woods was one of our first mystery yeah. uh, collector mm-hmm. books a long time ago, and I had to bully our English partner into getting enough copies signed um, in order to make that work for us. But yeah, I thought I got that her. was a really wonderful book. Um, yeah. and she's an interesting writer because she doesn't do just all police procedurals. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. We're talking about Kate Atkinson with another uh, writer. Mm-hmm. Have you read him, Sarah? You, she, mm-hmm. I enjoy her stuff, really, really smart. Um, so if we don't have any other questions, let me ask the one I always like to ask, what is it you're working on now? Because one likes to think that now that you've published a book, you're actually going to write another one. <laughs> well, I've actually finished my next manuscript. It is set in, in 1955 on the campus of Harvard, our um, incoming freshman at Radcliffe. And it's all about what's going to happen to these women. Are they going to remain um, little women of the 50s or are they going to explore their the possibilities and see what life's really going to be like on the other side through literature? We learn about them through uh, life crises. So I'm very excited about it. It's really- I fun. was actually accepted uh, at Radcliffe, the class of 58 had I oh. wanted to go. I went to Stanford instead because I didn't want to go to a women's college. It just didn't, didn't interest me, but I've often thought how my life would have been dramatically different had I had I chosen to go to Radcliffe or Smith, for that matter, or Duke. All of those were possibilities. But um, this was said in 1956, so okay. just well, about that time. Could have been a character in the book. I could. <laughs> I know. If you live a really long life, what happens there is that your life turns into history, <laughs> which is really unnerving. I'm here to tell. Uh, you. I've I've lived through a lot of history <laughs> in only 32 years, so. I don't know. Uh, my second book, I actually also just uh, just turned in uh, my second book. Um, it's set in Hollywood during World War II, and it's uh, set at uh, something that I, I didn't know about until I, I was trying to research other uh, World War II um, things that interested me. Um, in Hollywood uh, during World War II, um, Betty Davis and John Garfield started a thing called the Hollywood Canteen, which was just a place where every night um, servicemen could come and dance with movie stars and they'd have famous bands. They had like a whole Hollywood Canteen orchestra and they served free food and um, and so what happens is it's a it's a murder mystery set in that Ooh. world in World War II. Yeah. I love it. Do you feel like you're going to stay in World War II? Or, you know, is it just a sort of segue from this book to this to the new one? Um I didn't really want to do World War II. I was highly encouraged to uh, do World War II. Um, but I really found it because after I wrote the first book I I hadn't I didn't really say I was interested in World War II I was more interested in the Manhattan Project just kind of separately um and um the source books wanted like something else kind of in that World War II space um from me and 
I, I was like a little resistant to it, but I ended up really loving writing and researching and working on, on this, this second project. So my answer before I wrote the second book would have been probably not, but now who knows? Cause I, I feel like I've unlocked more, a, a lot more interest. Well, neither of you has started a series, which means you've got a lot more freedom to write different things. You haven't automatically pigeoned yourself, you know, in, in one particular slot. So um, that's, that's really good. Well, thank, thank you for spending time with us. It's really been a pleasure to introduce both of you with your debut novels to our readers. Um, so I must add that while Julia's book, Those Who Are Lost, is currently available and on sale, Sarah's book doesn't actually publish until July 26th. And so we were encouraged not to sell it ahead of time. And I can't remember, do we actually have copies at the store, Patrick? We, do, don't we? we sure do. <laughs> yeah. so we'll just sneak them out. And, sorry, <laughs> publisher, if you're listening to this. Because um, it'd be cruel to make people wait after they've listened to this conversation. But um, it was very nice of Sourcebooks <laughs> to let us have you both together for obvious reasons, since there's so many parallels um, that we've been able to explore. Uh, but anyway, most of you will find Sarah's book a little bit later. Um, than right now. So ladies, thank you so much. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their evening. Good night. Thank you so thank much. You. Really thank a pleasure. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.